As you know, with screen, and I'm going to be talking about screening, which is near and dear to my heart, and especially screening ultrasound, which is, I think, uh, a very controversial area in this country, but is certainly being widely adopted in many other countries at this time. Um, here we have a slide that just shows survival as a function of the size of the tumor at detection. And with breast cancer, the earlier we can find it, the better the outcome for the patient. With mammography, we expect to find the cancers when they're between one and two centimeter, and they have about a 90% overall survival at 16 years. Clinical breast exam, they're going to be larger, and they don't do as well. At this time, mammography is the only screening test which has been shown to reduce the deaths due to breast cancer, and there's an approximately 40% reduction in mortality among women who actually participate in screening. Well, we know women are still dying from breast cancer, and why is that? <clears throat> the majority of those women have not had screening mammography, but there are still some who have, in fact, had the screening. A few of them are going to just simply have been unfortunate, have high-grade tumors that have developed in the interval between screens, and there's nothing even in retrospect. But there's a good percentage of those women who have dense breasts, and we simply aren't seeing that cancer on the mammogram, and that is the group of patients where adding ultrasound to mammography indeed should be helpful. We certainly know that we can find many more cancers in that setting. The goals of any supplemental screening test, of course, to detect cancers when they're small. As I mentioned, we would like to see them when they're about a centimeter in size on average. They should be node negative. And Importantly, and especially as was emphasized with the task force guidelines that came out last October and November, we want to minimize any harms to healthy women. We certainly don't want to be doing a lot of unnecessary biopsies in women who do not have cancer if we can avoid that. So I want to talk just for a few minutes about the results of the multicenter Akron trial that I led and that Dr. Stavros and Dr. Mendelssohn were participants in. In that study, we enrolled uh, 2,800 women at 21 sites in the United States and Canada, all of whom were at some elevated risk for breast cancer and had at least heterogeneously dense breasts. Women had an annual mammogram and ultrasound each year for three years, and these were independently interpreted. Overall, across the three years of the study, we found that just over half of the cancers were seen on mammography, and very similar, just over half of cancers could be seen on ultrasound alone. When we looked at the supplemental yield of ultrasound, there was an increase in cancer detection of 29%, which is quite substantial. And of those cancers we see with ultrasound, the vast majority were invasive and node negative, with a median size of 10 millimeter. So we're finding exactly the types of cancers that we most need to be finding it stands to reason this should improve survival, but that wasn't studied. Here we have just a few examples. A woman with very dense breasts, nothing seen on mammography, and on ultrasound she had a two centimeter grade one node negative invasive and introductal carcinoma. Another patient with extremely dense breasts, elevated lifetime risk, and here she had this seven millimeter invasive lobular cancer in the right breast, and an 8-millimeter invasive lobular cancer in the left breast, both of which were seen only on ultrasound and both node negative. However, unfortunately, and one of the big issues with screening ultrasound and one of the reasons that centers are resistant to implementing this in their practice is the issue of false positives. So overall, and these are with annual screens, so the first screen is a little worse, but even with annual incident screening ultrasound, we have an overall 7 to 8% increase in the recall rates, which includes women recommended for short-term follow-up, additional testing, and biopsy. And here's an example of the downside, if you will, to screening ultrasound. This woman had heterogeneously dense breasts, and on mammography, she had suspicious calcifications seen in the left breast that were biopsied and were shown to be intermediate-grade DCIS. And on ultrasound in the right breast, she had this lesion, which was considered indeterminate, essentially just slightly, indis uh, indis slightly indistinctly marginated, and this was a ruptured cyst. Uh, so the ultrasound not only prompted a false positive biopsy, but it also missed her cancer. So not very helpful in her case. 
And overall cysts were very, very common, uh, as you might not be surprised to know. Uh, in the screening ultrasound protocol, of just under half of women had some cysts at some time in the, exam in the study. And in fact, even postmenopausal women, 39% of women had cysts. And that's one thing when they're over a centimeter in size, they're easy to tell, but when we get smaller and smaller cysts, it can be very difficult to be certain that we're talking about a simple cyst that is, of course, a benign finding. And in fact, overall, 14% of our patients actually had complicated cysts with debris, and these, of course, can be difficult to distinguish from a solid mass that might need intervention. Many of these lesions did have at least short-term follow-up, if not biopsy, but only two out of 475 such lesions actually proved to be cancer. So this is a huge source of false positives, and if we could do something about these lesions, we would be much better off. Here are just some examples. These particular cases are not from the trial, but this patient had a, a small, nearly anechoic, essentially circumscribed mass, then this was an ultrasound done because of an MRI finding in a woman who had metastatic nodes, and this was a high-grade, uh, poorly differentiated cancer. Here's another patient. This looked like a small cyst on the initial ultrasound on the left. Sorry, I can't get this pointer to work now. Um, the follow-up exam on the right, you could see it had gotten larger, and this was papillary DCIS. But again, it can be very difficult to distinguish small cysts from small solid masses, and especially high-grade cancers can look cystic. Here was one patient from the Akron protocol who was thought to have, well, she had multiple cysts in both breasts, and she had this one mass that was thought to be just a complicated cyst. You can see the arrow. Again, I can't get this to point right this second. Um, and this was recommended for six-month follow-up, and it grew a little bit, and this was an invasive lobular cancer. So again, there's tremendous interest, as you've heard tonight from my colleagues, in adding this feature of elasticity of the lesion to the BIREDS features to try to help distinguish those few cancers that we might otherwise follow, and also to downgrade many of these very low suspicion lesions uh, rather than having to biopsy them. And cysts have a very characteristic signature appearance on any of the elastography systems, on shear wave, the shear waves do not propagate, so the lesion appears black. Uh, it's a very characteristic appearance. Here's a mass uh, among the cases the, with the blinded read that I did where I thought there might be a fluid debris level. You could argue about the margins, but it looked like it could be a complicated cyst. And on shear wave, though, it was, again, had this halo of stiffness at the edges of the lesion, clearly suspicious, and this was a high-grade invasive ductal cancer. Another case that looked like it could possibly be a cyst, but in fact uh, obviously has some flow within it on the power Doppler image, and indeed appears stiff at the periphery on elastography, again a high-grade invasive ductal cancer. So the one specific subset of lesions I wanted to look at within the study that David described to you of all these lesions, 939 total, um, there were a, a subset of 181 masses which were oval, and circumscribed, really what we would consider probably benign if it was a solitary such finding, and maybe even benign outright if there were multiple bilateral such findings, but common problem that we see a lot of these on ultrasound. Um, and to look at that subset and see if we could improve on the outcomes. And among those 181 lesions in the prospective trial reads, 144 of them were considered by REDS-3, including four cancers. There were another 37 that were classified as BIREDS 4A with no cancer, so those were all false positives. And again, as it's been described, this, we looked at adding elasticity to the underlying BIREDS description, where the red is stiff and the uh, greenish to bluish is um, soft. And by so doing, we were able to correctly upgrade all four of the cancers that had been inappropriately considered probably benign prospectively. There were only eight false positive upgrades as a result of adding this just simple color feature of the stiffness. And meanwhile, we were able to downgrade all 34 of the um, BIREDS 4A masses that were um, benign. And here are just a few examples. This palpable circumscribed oval mass in a 27-year-old should be a fibroadenoma. 
and in fact is soft on elastography on shear wave, and this was a fibroadenoma. Here was an eight millimeter oval mass. We could argue a little bit about the margins, but it was prospectively described as circumscribed, and it was stiff, and again, this was correctly then upgraded to grade three invasive ductal cancer. Another lesion that appears mostly circumscribed, maybe in retrospect, if I could point, oh, there, there it goes. Little tiny tail in retrospect, but it was called circumscribed and oval prospectively. And this, again, was stiff on elastography and correctly then would be upgraded to uh, biopsy. And this was, again, high-grade invasive ductal cancer. So I found it reassuring that the upgrades were actually the most severe clinically, you know, the high-grade cancers. So in conclusion, we found in the Akron protocol that complicated cysts and other benign appearing solid masses were very common on screening ultrasound. It's a real clinical problem. Um, and we know from at least the Akron experience that we had a very low malignancy rate. It was actually 0.7% in the paper I presented this afternoon among lesions that were put into BIREDS 3. But the few cancers that we would falsely put into BIREDS 3 tend to be high grade invasive cancers. And certainly in this subset of, of lesions from this multicenter prospective trial, we found that shear wave elastography can help identify those few cancers which would otherwise be followed and can also help avoid biopsy for many low suspicion lesions. And here's some breasts with very stiff lesions. Thank you.